It's showtime. <laughs> The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes. 
those were the magnificent legendary Eagles, one of the best rock and roll groups of all time. And I'll be playing a lot of music by them this year. And I'm Dr. Minarsik. And uh, I'm in Chicago still. I'll probably be in Chicago during most of these sessions. It's 9 o'clock a.m. It's uh, Tuesday. It's uh, that uh, infamous day in American history called uh, 9-11. This is September 11th today, and this is our third session of uh, the 2012 to 2013 free global online medical school pathology course. How are you doing today? Uh, it's a great day here in Chicago. We still have pretty good weather, and uh, you know what we do now. For those of you who have been here before, we have to do a couple of test questions. And the first test question is, can you hear me? Because I would not like to think I was talking into the wall. Yes, everybody can hear me. There's a lot of you here today, again. And the second question I want to ask you is, what do you see on the screen? Yep, you saw the buzzard. Last uh, session, somebody asked, asked me, what is a buzzard? Because I always call you buzzards. And a buzzard is a vulture. It's a, a bird that cleans up uh, dead uh, bodies out of the desert or wherever. And uh, there's all kinds of different uh, vultures or buzzards. And this is one of the more colorful ones. So that's why I put it up for our uh, background today. So good morning, you buzzards. A couple of uh, small announcements before we get into our first uh, real session of Robbins. Probably a lot of you have been wondering, well, when the hell does the pathology start? He showed us lab cases. He showed us introductory. He told us what it's like to be a pathologist. When do we start the course? The course starts today. The first uh, announcement I want to make is, because there's a very large number of you, uh, and I noticed last time I was not able to even uh, read, much less answer all of your uh, pathology related questions. We have a pathologist in the audience from India. His name is Dr. Girish Kamat and he is a very famous pathology professor and he knows a hell of a lot more than I do. So if you have questions about pathology or what I'm talking about and you type those questions into the question box, uh, he will answer them for you as quickly as you can. Now, I can't answer them for you while I'm speaking, but he can answer them for you instantly. So instant answers to your questions is the most important thing. If somebody answers your question an hour later or a day or a week later, it's almost like it doesn't even matter anymore. So uh, if you just type into the question part uh, box, uh, welcome Dr. Kamat, K-A-M-A-T, He'll know that you're here, and he'll know that he's ready to serve you, and I really appreciate his services. So if you just want to type into the question marks, hello, Dr. Kamat. Yep, I could see you got the message. The next question is, uh, in the last session, uh, I noticed that uh, I didn't really give you time to speak. We had time to chat, but we did not really have time to speak. So what I promise to do today is... Uh, Take the last 10 minutes of this session, and if any of you have microphones and you want to say things, verbal questions, comments, you know, Dr. Kamat and I will be glad to respond to them. Uh, okay, uh, one more, two, three more little announcements. I, I'm assuming that you're getting good notifications for these webinars. Like, I also registered myself as a student, and I notice I get a, a announcement for the webinar, usually the day before, and even an hour before. So uh, I'm assuming that if you are getting the nice generated emails announcing the webinar and a little link for you to click on, then uh, all you do have to do is say, uh, yes, yes, yes. And uh, it looks like you've already started to do that. So um, uh, another thing I mentioned and I'll say it again because this is what I thought I might want to reinforce. Uh, a lot of people, uh, even around the world, have asked me, you know, for my technique here on how to be a one-man broadcasting studio from your own home. Uh, if any of you would like to learn this technique, you know, we can give this technique at our uh, laboratory studio at GoPath. 
which is in the Chicago area. So if any of you are in the Chicago area and you want to learn the technique or just to come to the one of the live classes, just email me and we'll make sure that we set you up for a Tuesday or a Thursday at 9.30. If any of you have the time to go there regularly, we could probably arrange that as well. Because, you know, it's nice to have people online. Uh, it's nice to have people watch my movies. But to have people actually around you is going to make this uh, uh, session even uh, more rocking. So that's it. Now, let's talk about our chapter today, okay? We're going to actually start the chapter called Cellular Adaptations, Cellular Injury, cellular death. This is kind of like the beginning of pathology. Uh, you may have noticed that up until now we have not overwhelmed you with a lot of details and a lot of facts, but what we have done is kind of started slow. So you're probably wondering, well, when does this course get horrible? When does this course get hot and heavy? When does this course get overwhelming with details? Well, the answer is it probably will never get that way. There are a few chapters where I have to shovel a lot of stuff at you. This is not one of them. This is, this is a fun chapter. This is my favorite chapter. Of course, you'll probably hear me saying that every chapter is my favorite chapter, but this is going to be a nice, smooth, wonderful chapter, and uh, there's not going to be a hell of a lot to memorize. We're going to go into like the main, main, main concepts of pathology. So I'm assuming you're all seeing the cell there in the middle, and uh, I'll just ask you, are you seeing the cell? If you are, that means my PowerPoint is working. Yes, you are. So let's start uh, talking about cellular adaptations, cellular injury, cellular death. If you have read the first chapter of Robbins, uh, you may have enjoyed it, but you may have found that a lot of things uh, you may have had a tough time with, or you didn't really know what was important and what was not important. Well, I have extracted what is important, and that's what's on these PowerPoints. So our objectives for learning today, uh, like we have already said several times, is understand the three main anatomic concepts of disease. Degenerative, which is loss of cells. Inflammatory, which is disruption of cells by inflammatory processes. And neoplastic, which is unregulated proliferation of cells. We're going to talk about the Plasia and the Trophy Brothers. There's a lot of terms that are used uh, very often in pathology and medicine, hyperplasia, hypoplasia, blah, blah, blah. And uh, to tell you the truth, probably about a half of the time the terms are not used correctly. So at least we want to make sure that we define them correctly. And at least if you hear them incorrectly sometime in the future, at least you'll know you learned them correctly once. We're going to talk about all the things that could go wrong with the cell. We're going to talk about the different ways to injure of cell. We're going to talk about uh, hypoxic injuries, physical injuries, chemical, infection, immunogenic. We're generally going to go in a broad way to the things that interfill with normal cell lives. We're also going to talk about uh, pathologic mechanisms at the subcellular level, not just what happens to cells, but what happens to the things inside the cells, like mitochondria, calcium, you know, free radicals, membranes. You're probably going to learn that if your mitochondria die, your cell dies. If your membrane dies, your cell dies. Uh, and that's uh, something that is also uh, a real uh, written law in pathology. We're going to talk about the uh, concepts of apoptosis and necrosis. Both of them are cell death, but apoptosis is more like dying because of old age, and necrosis is more like dying before you get to be old because of some disease. They're not two completely different mechanisms. They generally have a spectrum, but you have to understand that some cells die just because it's their time to die. That's a normal process. And then some cells die because of various types of injuries. We're also going to understand subcellular responses to injury. What happens to the lysosomes, smooth ER, mitochondria, cytoskeleton, stuff like that. And finally, one of the objectives is to look at some of the things that can accumulate inside of cells. You know, one of the big, big, big principles in pathology, which I'm going to mention in my book as well, is that if a, uh, there is something in the cell that, uh, like an enzyme, for example, 
that does not work or it's not there or it was genetically absent because the gene that codes it is absent. The substances which it has to process can build up. So all kinds of stuff can build up in the cell. All three categories of biochemicals, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, like glycogen, and also pigments. And we're going to learn the difference between an exogenous pigment, something that came from the environment, and an endogenous pigment, something that is normally present in your body, like uh, bile or hemosiderin or melanin. And finally, we're going to make a few concepts, philosophical concepts of, you know, why do cells die? Uh, why do people die? You know, do they die because uh, they get sick or they die because uh, it's just their time to die? And these are really kind of uh, things that have been debated for a long time. And you'll find out that the pre-programmed death theory is uh, much more uh, pr predominant than the wear and tear theory. So what's pathology? Uh, taken from the Greek, pathos means suffering. It means the clinical expression of diseases in many cases. And logos is the study of. That's the, the one thing that we always start out with. You also have to remember that in this course, we're going to spend about the first third of the academic year talking about general pathology, general concepts like inflammation, like neoplasia, like flow uh, or hemodynamic disturbances like infectious diseases, immunologic disease, just general concepts. And then the uh, second two-thirds or the rest of the year, we're going to be talking about pathology of organ systems. Now when I was in the medical school and we went over autopsies, we always had a checklist of 10 systems of the body. Well, you know, in terms of pathology, people like to split things. Like, they like to split the uh, GI system into liver, pancreas, and four tubular organs. They like to split the uh, uh, brain into peripheral nerve, central nervous system, eye. So I think that there's 19 topics that we'll discuss in systemic. We will definitely finish the first 10 general pathology chapters before what I call Christmas break or holiday break, you know, which will be mid-December. And we'll also throw in a couple of systemic things before then also. I can't say exactly what because people have asked me, oh, do you have an exact schedule of when you'll be talking about what? And I say, no, I just talk until I get tired or the two hours runs out. So what is a disease? A disease is something that has four things. It has to have a cause, something we call an etiology. It has to have a pathogenesis. This is kind of a diff, more of a difficult thing to understand. I use the word insidious because a pathogenesis is the sequence of changes at the cellular and subcellular level during the course of a development of a disease, which usually precedes the actual patient's symptoms. And the patient may ne never have any clinical expression or symptoms. The, may pa the disease may be subclinical, you know, like most cases of hepatitis or most pulmonary emboli, they're subclinical. And they have to have a morphology. They have to have an abnormal morphology. So but getting back to our friend Rudolf Virchow again, Rudolf Virchow says that if a disease doesn't have an abnormal anatomy, it's not a disease. And, you know, that is uh, pretty much something I will stake my whole reputation on. And if that was not true, I probably wouldn't be teaching this course. So etiology means cause. Now, sometimes... Uh, we have, instead of cause, we use risk factors. And risk factors is kind of a cop-out because, like, for example, we know that the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis causes tuberculosis. It's a specific thing. But let's say we have a disease like atherosclerosis, and we're not exactly sure one specific cause. Then we'll talk about risk factors, you know, like cigarette smoking, diabetes, hypertension, you know, things like that. So... Uh, I think from a mathematical point of view, I think risk factors is probably acceptable because it means maybe we don't know the specific cause, but we're going to talk about things that are often present or statistically related to it. What about pathogenesis now, the second item? 
pathogenesis, defined a little bit more precisely, is the sequence of events from the initial stimulus, which causes the disease, to the ultimate expression of the disease. So when they talk about a pathogenesis of a disease, they're usually talking about cellular changes, uh, before the actual clinical expression of the disease. That's the best way to define pathogenesis. Now what about morphology? Pathology is abnormal anatomy. It's abnormal histology. It might be abnormal x-ray. It might be abnormal molecules even. But the morphology of a disease is something that was emphasized very, very much in the past. And whenever you uh, took a pathology course, all the pathologists would ever do is show you pictures of tumors and microscopic slides. And now the shift has become more towards how these things relate to the clinical expressions as well. But you cannot uh, ignore the fact that the morphology of disease is the thing that enables us to differentiate it and to diagnose it. So morphology is very, very important. And you'll never get this in a general uh, anatomy or histology class, you know. And you won't get it in a psychology class or a pathophysiology class. You have to understand, if you look at the abnormal patterns of cell behavior, like we talked about the classic three, that's pathology. We talk about gross pathology. You know, you have a brain that uh, is a little bit softer when you press on a slice. That's a gross finding, isn't it? You have a liver that's nodular. Even if you have a blindfold on, you feel a nodule on the liver. That's uh, abnormal. You talk about microscopic uh, abnormal anatomy, and that's basically what pathologists do. They put tissues and organs and under the microscope and they look at the cellular changes and they diagnose the disease. But the radiologists, you know, say, hey, that's no fair. We look at abnormal morphology too. And really the best radiologists are the ones that understand the pathology of what they're looking at, you know. Not just that there's a density or an infiltrate, but why there's a density or an infiltrate. And if you want to go even a step further, uh, a lot of the people that uh, are pure physiologists or, what, or teach what they call pathophysiology, which means they don't know what the hell they're looking at under a microscope, but the people that are the physiology, the pathophysiology uh, jockeys, they say, well, you know, uh, it's not always morphology. Sometimes it's uh, molecular or physiologic, but think about it. Now that we can see molecules under a microscope, just like we could see cells or you know, maybe we could see genes or uh, expressions of those genes, proteins, which you could stain. If you want to think of pathology as abnormal molecular anatomy, you could do that as well. And if you do that, that means that all diseases are anatomic alterations. That's the number one rule of Virchow. T clinical expression is the patient's symptoms. This is the uh, pathos of pathology. It's the suffering. Uh, it may be no clinical expression at all. In other words, the disease is subclinical. Uh, but it usually expresses some type of uh, symptom or perhaps abnormal lab finding or something very, very subtle. And most diseases do not start out with symptoms appearing boom, you know, like a bat out of hell. Most of them start out with a uh, very, very, very mild uh, symptoms which generally get worse very 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 evenly now um, there's two kinds of people in this world the people that think uh, according to images pictures visual learners and the people that think according to concepts now quite frankly the I think the concepts people are a little smarter than the image people uh, but the image people are what 90 percent of us are so what I would like you to do when we discuss, you know, the 18 million diseases this year is when you uh, think of a disease, for example, you know, lupus, for example, I want you to, in your mind, just close your eyes, you know, and think of some of the cellular changes involved. I want you to think of some inflammatory reaction in the blood vessel or a skin, which is the result 
of patient cells reacting against uh, their own nuclear proteins. Uh, I want you to get a visual image of a disease. And the image is usually, it could be at the gross level, it could be at the electron microscopic level. In most cases, it'll be at the light microscopic level, even without doing a bunch of special stains to look for antigens or to look for the genes which uh, produce those antigens. So uh, most pathologists will tell you, and I hope that this kind of is reflected in your behavior as well, is that when they think of a disease, they think of a slide that they saw. And we're going to be looking at approximately 500 different slides during the year. And if you don't like to look at them in lab, then remember, if you look at them in rock lab, if you don't want to look at them in class, there's about a five-minute movie associated with each one. So here we go. Rudy Virchow basically is saying that all diseases are the result of abnormal uh, arrangements of cells. Uh, he is the father. He is the god of pathology. If you went to a party where there are a bunch of pathologists and you said you don't like Rudy Virchow, they'd probably beat you up and throw you into the alley. But I want to bring up uh, another father of modern pathology who just happens to be my friend. And this is Dr. Vidae Kumar. And this is the man who wrote the Bible of pathology for your generation. And he did a remarkably good job, not just for the pathology, but some people say you could use it as also an internal medicine book as well. Dr. Kumar uh, gave our graduation uh, address at uh, last year. He's a remarkably good guy. He's very, very approachable. And uh, when I write my book on uh, pathology for dummies, he's going to be mentioned as one of the, probably at the very top of the list, as the most important pathology in the world. Okay, another way to think of disease, of course, uh, Rudy Virchow would probably forgive you, but if you want to think of disease as a disturbance of normal function, you can. You know, normal function, uh, physiologic processes in the body going the way they should be going is called homeostasis. So a disturbance of homeostasis can be defined as diseases as well. But remember, those disturbances are always caused by abnormal anatomic cells. Okay, let's talk about cell death in general before we get into it in detail. There's two kinds of cell death, apoptosis and necrosis. When I read my first edition of Robbins, you know, in the Stone Ages and back in the 70s, uh, there, the word apoptosis never even appeared in the entire book. Now, I did a word count on a, a book, and it appears like about 300 times. It's one of the most important concepts because it's talking about cells that die, but they die because they have to, simply to make way for you know either reparative processes or development of the cells. What we always talked about in the old days was necrosis, and we probably would lump apoptosis in there because when you look at the changes of the nucleus and the cytoplasm in necrosis, they're almost identical to what you see in apoptosis as well, but necrosis is technically a premature or untimely death due to causes, all the various causes that we're gonna be talking about, whereas apoptosis is normal dropping out of cells to give way for other cells. They're not two completely separate processes. There's a concept called uh, pathologic apoptosis, which is more like necrosis than apoptosis. But we'll get into that later. Let's talk about the uh, Plasia brothers and the Trophy brothers. You have to understand, uh, I like to call them seven dwarfs. I guess you could probably think of a few more. There's only about three or four that are important. Uh, hyperplasia probably the most uh, commonly used uh, prefix before the word plasia, is the most commonly used of the plasia brothers. There's a, the opposite of hyperplasia, or too much growth, is hypoplasia, which is too little growth. And sometimes, if there's very, very little growth, rather than using hypoplasia, they will say aplasia, which is no growth. Often the term Hypoplasia is called hypotrophy or atrophy, and that's not really correct, but you know, it's just things that I use historically. The word you'll probably never see is normal 
hyperplasia. And I've used that word before in my pathology reports. And all that means that there's a normal pattern of growth. So if hyperplasia is too much growth and hypoplasia is too little growth, normoplasia is normal growth. One concept which we're going to see time and time again in this course is the concept of metaplasia. And metaplasia means normal growth, but it's in the wrong place. And the most common and the usual uh, prefix which appears before metaplasia is squamous metaplasia. So if you have uh, a squamocolumnar junction, like you do in the cervix or the uh, esophageal gastric or anorectal region, and you have an area where squamous cells are growing, where columnar cells used to grow, that's called metaplasia. There's a few other types as well. Uh, I want to mention that in most cases, 95% of the cases, when you hear the word dysplasia, dysplasia is defined as the sequence of cellular changes, both physiologic as well as anatomic, which precede the development of a malignancy. So if you're going to think that things are either benign or malignant, you have to remember there's an intermediate stage called dysplasia. And dysplasia often, but not always, actually leads to downright cancer. And once anything is downright malignant, you could use the word anaplasia. So is the word anaplasia exactly the same as malignant? Yes, it is. Sometimes in the literature, if you do a search in some of the uh, articles that come out, especially the older ones, they'll use the word frank anaplasia, just as a kind of a redundant uh, uh, adjective. In, in other words, they're not saying, this isn't just malignant, it's damn malignant. So they'll use the word frank anaplasia. In other words, it's not debatable anymore, like dysplasia might be debatable. But anaplasia is cancer. And frank anaplasia is really cancer. So here's hyperplasia. If you have, for example, a, a cut section of an adrenal gland, which you have here, uh, you'll see that the cortex is only about a millimeter thick. You see there's a nice yellow cortex separated from the brown medulla, and you can see it here. Well, hyperplasia means that this normal one millimeter of cells in the adrenal cortex is now like maybe three, four, five, six, seven millimeters. That's hyperplasia. And you could probably guess what this is above it when it's thinner than it should be. That's hypoplasia. Now we're going to see a case in the lab today called adrenal hypoplasia, but for some reason they decide to call it atrophy. So remember, a lot of these terms uh, are used wrong, but you still should understand what they're talking about. So here's a normal adrenal, and here is a hyperplastic adrenal cortex, and there's a hypoplastic adrenal cortex. I'm going to pop out the window for a second here, and I am going to ask you a question that's really funny. Do you see this adrenal here that I'm pointing to? Just say yes or no. Yeah, okay, can I ask you a question? Is that the left adrenal or is that the right adrenal? You probably think I'm nuts for asking you that, right? Well, you're saying right. The people that are saying right are correct because for some reason, the left adrenal is flatter than the right adrenal, usually. I don't know why, but if you think it's because it's sitting on top of the kidney and the liver is compressing it, that's one way of... Uh, imagining why it's flat. I don't think that's the real reason because most of the time they're not really right on top of the kidney. Anyway, I'm, that's just a little comic relief there. Here's hypoplasia now. Same picture, only now rather than going down to see the hyperplasia, you're doing hypoplasia, which is decreased number of cells. Okay, we talked about the plasia brothers, if you want to think of the seven dwarfs. And now we'll talk about a couple of trophy brothers, okay? Hypertrophy and hypotrophy. And for example, an extreme hypotrophy would be an atrophy. And hypertrophy means not increased cells, numbers, 
but increased cell sizes. And the classical example that is always the left ventricle. So when a left ventricle or a heart goes from a normal 300 grams to 800 grams, let's say, it's not because there's twice as many cells in the left ventricle. It's not because there's twice as many uh, cardiac muscle cells. It's because each cell is twice as big. So that's hypertrophy. You know, when your weightlifters develop biceps that are, you know, as big as your head, it's not because those cells have multiplied, it's because everyone has gotten bigger. And similarly, on the other side, hypotrophy is the opposite process. And very often, hypotrophy is more likely called atrophy. It's very rare to see the word hypotrophy in medical literature. It's almost always atrophy, atrophy, atrophy. But I want to tell you that about half the time you see the word atrophy, they really mean uh, hypoplasia. Now, uh, I don't even want to get into that last concept of dystrophy because dystrophy doesn't mean anything, okay? It just means abnormal, if you want to use the word dys. You know, the most, they talk about renal dystrophy or muscular dystrophy, and all that means is abnormal. So it doesn't have any logical meaning, but I just want to throw it in there to let you know there is a third trophy brother called dys, which we try to ignore. He's one of the bastard kids of the group, so we got to ignore him, pretend like he's not there. So here's hypertrophy now. You got a normal left ventricle, you look at the size of the cells, and then you got a heart that's twice as big. You know, here's the left ventricle, here's the septum, here's the right ventricle. And at the same power, these muscle cells are twice the size. So this uh, heart uh, is twice as big as it should be, not because twice as many cells, but the cells are twice as big, so the heart is twice as big. Uh, hypotrophy is decrease in the size of the cells. It's a rarely used term. And when you look at the opposite side, atrophy, technically it's due to decrease in size of the cells. And it could generally be due to a shrinkage in the cell size due to loss of cell substance or loss of cell oxygen or loss of cell nutrients, but it's not due to loss of a number of cells. However, in many, many cases, when they use the word atrophy, they really mean hypoplasia, which is loss of number of cells. So let's talk about this more fuzzy concept of atrophy. Why do cells atrophy? Why do they decrease in size? Well, one reason is simply because like, for example, in the case of muscle, but other functioning cells, there just happens to be a decreased workload, okay? They just don't have to work as hard as they normally do. You lay in the bed all day, rather than going out and running and doing push-ups, you know, you're gonna, your muscles are going to atrophy, and that happens in many, many of your patients that will be hospitalized or inactive due to diseases. In the case of muscle, again, the most common reason for an atrophic muscle is that the nerve supplying it has been severed or not there or is diseased. So denervation atrophy is a very common concept. If you would think that there could be atrophic cells or organs because of decreased blood flow, decreased nutrition, decreased glucose, that's another thing too. If you don't feed kids, they don't grow. If you don't feed cells, they don't grow. And of course, aging is a process. The atrophy of aging is generally called involution, and you'll see that in a lot of uh, endocrine glands, but other areas. Uh, for example, they talk about involution of the thyroid. Now, for those of you who had your gross anatomy last year and you're picking away the thyroid, and you looked at the uh, box, it says, well, you know, the thyroid should weigh normally about, you know, you know, 10 to 25 grams. And this one only weighs 8 grams. Well, that's very, very common to older people. A lot of things just get smaller. Uh, as hormones uh, withdraw, you know, in the gonads, in the uh, organs, it just becomes atrophic. And um, also, even mechanical forces like pressure on things can cause atrophy of cells. If you put pressure on an organ because of a tumor compressing it, that organ or that tissue will become atrophic as well. Uh, we have to define metaplasia now. And uh, it's a very, very, very easy thing. And almost 
Oh, probably about 90% of the time when you hear the word metaplasia, they are talking about squamous metaplasia, in which a squamous epithelium replaces a columnar epithelium. And this is what occurs at squamal columnar junctions. Now remember, you have a squamal columnar junction in the cervix. You have a squamal columnar junction in your gastroesophageal area because the esophagus is squamous and the stomach is columnar. And you have a squamous columnar junction in your anorectal region too. The anus is squamous, the rectum is columnar. The process is due to the fact that whenever you subject a columnar mucosa to the same general forces that are better handled by a thicker squamous mucosa, then the columnar mucosa becomes squamous. It's a normal adaptive process. So when we talked about cell adaptation at the beginning or the title of this chapter, this is one of the most common forms of cell adaptation. Um, so you could have it in the stomach, you could have it anywhere. Another, but it's not always limited to squamal columnar. I could think of another example of metaplasia is when normally you have fibrous tissue and for some reason rather than an inflammatory process being uh, ultimately forming fibrous tissue, it forms bone. That would be called osseous metaplasia. And there's a few other kinds of metaplasia, but most of the time you hear the word metaplasia, you're going to assume that it's squamous. But remember, whenever a tissue is subjected to the forces of the other types of epithelium, then it becomes that type of epithelium. And why did I draw this little X here? Because you could think of this little X as being a dividing line. You're supposed to have squamous on one side and columnar on the other. That's the squamal columnar junction. So if this, for example, is the columnar side of the line, then expect to see some squamous changes if the columnar epithelium is subjected to the same forces that the squamous usually is. Cell death. It's very, very difficult to define death from a philosophic or even a biologic point of view. But the one thing that's easy to define is whether a cell uh, is uh, reversible or irreversible. Okay. Another thing that you can normally differentiate is whether a cell dies because it's normally replaced or whether it's, there's an abnormal process going on to cause it to die, apoptosis versus necrosis. But rather than try to sit around here for hours and talk about what causes death or what is death, it's probably just as difficult as what is life. You have to remember that death of a cell or a human or a tissue is an irreversible process. You can't take dead cells and make them arise again. Okay? So the question is not what is life or death, but what is reversible or irreversible. And you could say that the changes that occur in the cell that are irreversible will cause cell death. The changes that occur in the cell which are reversible may not cause cell death, but they could lead to it if they are sustained or worsened. So what are some of the reversible changes that we have in cells? Well, one of them is reduced oxygen, reduced oxidative phosphorylation, maybe damage mitochondria, but not uh, fatally damage mitochondria, maybe decrease in flow due to blood vessels. Uh, if there's reduced oxygen in a cell, that's not necessarily going to kill it. If there's ATP depletion in a cell, like in myocardial cells that in an infarct, that's not necessarily going to kill it. Even a cell can become swollen, which means it loses its ability to pump out that sodium in the cell membrane. And that's not even an irreversible change. So remember, if you wanted to think in terms of three, these are three changes which are reversible. They are often reversible. But if they are prolonged or worsened, they could then uh, proceed to an irreversible change.
So what are irreversible changes? Uh, here's a good general principle to remember. If your mitochondria are dead, your cell is dead. If your mitochondria don't work, the cell is going to die. Okay, because that's what's making the oxygen. If your membrane is dead, if your membrane doesn't work, then the cell will die also. So anything that's irreversible at the cell membrane level or the mitochondrial level will cause death of the cell. Another thing to remember is that one of the processes that occurs in necrosis and apoptosis is that eventually the lysosomes within the cell start to digest the substance of the cell. And of course, if a cell is already auto-digesting, okay, getting it ready for phagocytosis, uh, then that's an irreversible change as well. When I was in the Caribbean last year, I saw a big bug on my doorstep, and I'm looking at it, and it's just like standing still. It wasn't moving. And I thought, is this thing going to climb up my leg, or is this thing going to move? So I looked at the big, huge bug a little bit closer, and I saw that ants were already eating it up. So I said, uh-oh, that's dead. The lysosomes are already auto-digesting it. Reversible changes are regarded as cell injury. Irreversible changes are regarded as cell death. And don't forget, even something called injury, which is reversible, can lead to death if it's prolonged and or severe enough. Now, if you have seen the movie called The Usual Suspects with uh, Kevin Spacey, you kind of might remember this picture. It's like when, you know, whenever a crime happens, they kind of round up the usual bums that are in the neighborhood and they put them in a lineup. So, like, when we talk about things that injure cells or cause cancer in cells or cause mutations in cells, they're always the usual suspects. And I'm going to make this very simple for you because this is going to come up time after time after time again. You see these five guys here? Well, there's only three usual suspects that cause just about everything in pathology. And one of them is in the realm of what we call physical agents, you know, like radiation, like trauma. One of them is in the realm of chemical agents, toxic substances, and the others are infectious pathogens. So when you say, you know, what causes cancer? What causes birth defects? What causes uh, cell injury? What causes cell death? Uh, what causes uh, uh, teratogenesis? You always got to think of these three usual suspects. So I want you to remember physical, chemical, infectious. And whenever you go to a pathology lecture and they talk about uh, the categories of things that are bad guys, these are always on the list. I guess hypoxia can, is probably always number one on the list. I'm not too sure how it fits in with these guys, but hypoxia is probably the number one general cause of cell injury and ultimately cell death. Sometimes I'll talk about immunologic causes or genetic causes or nutritional causes. I'm not too sure how this actually fits into the picture here. They kind of overlap a lot, but I want you to remember that these three red guys are the usual suspects. So, like, if you were to ask me what causes cancer, well, I'll say the usual suspects. Oh, what causes birth defects? The usual suspects. Uh, what causes cell injury? The usual suspects. What causes cell death? The usual suspects. Now, if you look at the uh, reversible uh, injury mechanisms we've mentioned, decreased ATP is a reversible cell injury mechanism. Damage, but not death, to the mitochondria is also reversible. In these reversible changes, very often you have buildup of calcium within the cell. So just like the water may not, or the sodium may not be able to leave the cell too well, and the cell becomes swollen, then it also generally, in a nonspecific way, usually there's a buildup of calcium as well. Very often there's an increase in free radicals in injured cells, and this may be indeed exactly what is causing the injury as well, free radicals. You could put that into the category of chemicals, can't you? And also a thing that is seen over and over again, usually as a result 
but also as a cause of reversible cell injury mechanisms of, is increased cell membrane permeability. If you can't keep the sodium out and the potassium in, you got an injured cell. So why don't you just kind of remember these one, two, three, four, five things as the reversible things that are associated with reversible changes. Now I know you can probably know what is irreversible, what is death, what is life. This is something that you know we'll never figure out. But death, from a pathologic point of view, is either irreversible mitochondrial dysfunction or profound membrane disturbances. If the membrane doesn't keep the stuff out, the cell is dead. If the mitochondria don't keep the uh, ATP and oxygen feeding that cell, the cell is dead. In terms of what is life, you know, that's for the philosophers. That's not for me. So let's talk about some of these changes now uh, from the point of view of uh, the pathologist. Uh, I think it's a good general principle that the very closer that you look at something, the easier it is to tell whether it's dead, alive, or dying. Just like when I bent down to look at that big bug, I didn't know it was dead until I saw the ants crawling all over it. So, the probably what precedes death are reversible cell changes. Those reversible changes become irreversible often, and that's called death. So, irreversible changes is equal to death. Sometimes the very, very earliest way to see that in a cell is to look at the electron microscope, look at the mitochondria, look at the development of blebs, uh, little vesicles within the cell, look at the cell losing structure. Uh, sometimes you have to, or almost all the time, a dead or even a lot of injured cells can be seen as certain changes under light microscopy. And of course, a good pathologist will tell you, and all the old good pathologists will tell you, that anything that you can see under a microscope you can probably see or feel or touch uh, very, very well, and I suspect it just from looking at the organ or the uh, tissue grossly. So here's the lowest level. Here's the, uh, or actually highest level. Here's a normal cell. You can see some microvilli. You can see some organelles. You can see small organized vesicles. Well, look, in the uh, uh, injured cell, there's some leakage of material. You don't see a good lining of the microvilli anymore. Bigger vesicles are building up. You're losing some structure of mitochondria and other substances. And of course, when you're looking at it now as a dead cell, even though the nucleus may still be present or it's may perhaps starting to dissolve, you can see that there are no fine details. So this is just a general uh, thing showing it from a normal cell to an injured cell to a dead cell. Now, could a cell like this uh, become uh, normal again? Well, remember, any injured cell can become normal again. Here's a light microscope. If you might recognize this as being uh, cardiac muscle or myocardium, you can see that the uh, nuclei is in the center of the fiber. There's some branching. Here's an intercalated disc. There's a lot of nice little... Uh, capillaries and small veins between the fibers. That looks pretty good, but look, we're starting to see the nucleus now is being lost. You're starting to see infiltration of, of vessels. Now, does this mean that these inflammatory cells are killing the myocardium? No, it means the opposite. It means that these dead cells are now acting as garbage for these inflammatory cells to clean up, to phagocytize. And dead tissue, whether it's gross or microscopic, is called necrosis. Okay? So in pathology, you'll hear various adjectives classically put before the word necrosis. And I have to tell you that some of these adjectives almost make it diagnosis for where, diagnostic for where the necrosis is. For example, if you hear the term liquefactive necrosis, they're almost always referring to brain tissue. However, anything that's necrotic, it's also characterized by a lot of fluid, a lot of watery dissolution of the substances and increase in fluid is technically liquefactive necrosis. But probably nine times out of 10, 
you see the word liquefactive for necrosis. They're referring to central nervous system tissue or brain. Gangrenous necrosis, oh, uh, that's a uh, thing that is generally related to ischemic necrosis, but a gangrenous uh, extremity like an arm or a leg or gangrenous bowel uh, can uh, be, uh, is regarded as necrosis also. And it's usually used in terms of extremities or bowel. Now, if that gangrenous necrosis is associated with a lot of fluid as well, perhaps secondary to the necrosis, or perhaps even in the early stages of inflammation, you call that wet gangrene. If the gangrenous necrosis, you may have seen these in hospital patients, if the toe is completely dark and black and dry, that's called dry gangrene. Um, and usually, you know, I, I had some students argue with me about this, and they'll say, well, what comes first, wet dry gangrene or dry gangrene? Well, it's, it, it's, that's not really what matters. What matters is if, that, if a uh, tissue is gangrenous and is characterized by a lot of fluid, uh, either as a reaction to the dry gangrene or preceding the gangrene. That's called wet gangrene. Dry means it's as dry as could be. Sometimes the word fibrinoid necrosis is used, and that means microscopically when you look at the necrotic tissue, it has kind of a eosinophilic and granular or hyaline, and we're going to discuss the word hyaline later, appearance. And very often the word fibrinoid necrosis is used uh, with either rheumatoid arthritis or uh, very often in terms of the walls of blood vessels that have been affected by autoimmune diseases. Caseous necrosis is pretty good. Caseous is either the Greek or French or Latin word for cheese. So whenever you cut through something and it crumbles like cheese because it doesn't have texture, because it's necrotic, because the cell structure is broken down. That's called caseous necrosis. Now, it just turns out that caseous necrosis is almost always used uh, regarding tuberculosis. But any tissue that crumbles when you cut it grossly can be called caseous necrosis. Sometimes the word fat precedes the word necrosis, and fat necrosis means that uh, you have fat tissue, but it doesn't look that normal, soft, uh, yellow appearance. It looks like it might be a little blackish or bloody or hard, and that's fat necrosis. And that's usually in regards to a breast that has been subjected to surgical trauma, but fat necrosis can be seen in many other places. Ischemic necrosis is kind of redundant. It's related to caseous necrosis. It could be related to all these necrosis. And all that means is we have dead tissue because of lack of blood flow, lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients. So is ischemic necrosis uh, the same as infarcted tissue? Yeah, it probably is. Sometimes you'll hear the word in ortho, avascular necrosis or aseptic necrosis. And that means it's necrotic because it didn't have enough blood flow. And that almost always refers to bone, but it can also uh, refer to other things as well. Uh, and if you look at our favorite little dictionary called One Look, and you just type in the word necrosis, and you put in a uh, asterisk before the necrosis, you'll see there's 153 words that commonly precede the word necrosis, but these are your top eight or so. There's liquefactive necrosis of a brain. When you look at it grossly, you may not know where the uh, liquid part is. If you're looking at it with a MRI scan and there's increased water and therefore increased protons, you could see liquefactive necrosis very good. Sometimes what the pathologists do is they put a blindfold on after they slice the brain and they feel it with their fingers because sometimes you could feel softening better with your fingers than with your eye. And of course, microscopically, you'll see that there's an area of increased edema, increased water, increased fluid in the intercellular space. And that should be an area of liquefactive necrosis microscopically. And don't forget, brain injury of just about any type is always characterized by increase in fluid. There also may be other things going on with it, like an increase of glial cells, for example, or demyelination, for example. 
But in almost every type of brain injury is characterized by softening of the brain. And softening means too much water. And you know, water is called H2O. And you want to know what those H things are? Those H things are protons, aren't they? So if you have more pro water, you have more protons, and you have more protons to recoil and spin, depending on how you zap your magnet. So uh, that's how we diagnose a lot of brain disease, whether it's a tumor, whether it's a stroke, whether it's multiple sclerosis. We say if it's fluid, if it's uh, liquefactive necrosis, there's going to be more water, more protons, and more signals than to come out of your MRI machine. Here's a lung. I think you could recognize that. There's a major fissure. It's probably a left lung. There's the base of the lung. There's the apex. And look, the, could you imagine that when you cut through this lung in an autopsy, it kind of crumbles a little bit? That's what crumbles like cheese. That's why it's called caseous necrosis. And by the way, even though caseous necrosis is a gross term, because cutting cheese is gross, very often, microscopically, when you see the granulomas of TB and they're necrotic, they'll call that caseous also, even though it's a misnomer. It's done all the time. Here's a blood vessel, and I think you could recognize that right away, but do you notice how the wall of the blood vessel is kind of like hyalinized? It doesn't have much texture to it. It has the same exact appearance of fibrin under a microscope. So that's why it's called fibrinoid necrosis. But remember, almost any kind of necrosis might express itself as pink, granular, eosinophilic, hyaline type material. In fact, I shouldn't have used the word hyaline, but I want to tell you, whenever you hear the word hyaline in pathology, it's nonspecific. All it means is pink, amorphous, often granular or glassy material. Hyalin is not anything specific, okay? That's one of the biggest mistakes students and even pathologists make. Okay, here's gangrene. And let's say that you looked at this gangrenous extremity. Maybe it's a diabetic or maybe some with severe vascular disease. And you go, whoa, there's a lot of water here, okay? So you call that wet gangrene. And let's say you look at another gangrenous toe and say, wow, that's as dry as a bone. That's dry gangrene. Now, if you're out in the battlefield uh, and, you know, somebody, uh, you're out there for a long time and, or somebody's uh, foot becomes gangrenous, maybe they were shot, you know, like in the days of the Civil War, uh, most deaths occurred to uh, gangrene. Um, what would happen if this very, very dry area then became an inflammatory focus and you wind up having a lot of blood vessels and fluid in it? Then you would have dry gangrene becoming wet gangrene, wouldn't you? But let's say that you had a wet gangrene like this and the inflammatory process kind of resolved, but you still had dead tissue. Then that would be dry gangrene. Okay. Uh, let's talk about examples of uh, cell injury and necrosis, the concept of ischemic or hypoxic necrosis. Probably one of the most uh, very, very common, the most common type of cell uh, necrosis is when you don't have enough blood vessel. It's also called infarcted tissue. But there's something called reperfusion as well, and this is what the cardiologists are always worried about when they reperfuse a myocardium when they do a bypass, for example. In a reperfusion injury, you have dead or injured tissue, and then you introduce oxygen back into it. You know, you put in a new blood vessel. Well, guess what? That oxygen is not just feeding the dead or dying tissue, but it's also feeding the inflammatory process, which is secondary. So not only is it trying to bring back the injured guys, but it's also feeding the cells which are causing the secondary damage and inflammation. So that's the concept of reperfusion injury. And of course, chemical injury, you know, is basically the number one thing you're going to have to worry about when you write prescriptions. You know, every single drug will injure a tissue uh, if it's in enough of a dose or given long-standing enough. And that's why we have things like base, uh, baseline liver enzymes before you institute a patient on a certain kind of a drug. 
Okay, we've said this before. I threw it in there to show you how important it is again. Reversible injuries due to ischemia, if they're long-standing enough, can become irreversible, and if they're dead, they are then called an infarct. And we're going to spend about half of a day on various kinds of infarcts when we get into heart and vascular diseases. Um, we already talked about the concept of reperfusion injury. And here, you, this, I think that this last thing is off of uh, Wikipedia, which I put here in the uh, lecture notes. And let's say it again, perhaps in different words. When you restore a blood flow to an injured area, you're also introducing oxygen. And the oxygen is not only trying to help the uh, cell, but it's also trying, it's also helping the uh, inflammatory cells that are chewing up the dead tissue as well. And of course, when you uh, put a blood vessel into a heart, hopefully to restore some of the dying or damaged myocytes, you want to make sure you're not making it worse rather than better. Chemical injuries, we're going to do a whole chapter on toxicity. Uh, sometimes they have a very, very predictable pattern of where they're going to occur. Uh, common drugs, whether they're, uh, you know, over-the-counter, you know, Tylenol, other, uh, just about every drug you could think of is a potential chemical injury. It's a xenobiotic. It's something that normally is not part of your chemical makeup. You know, this is all dependent on the uh, dose relationship. And, of course, chemical injuries can occur uh, uh, at the free radical level. They can cause free radicals. Radiation can cause free radicals within the cell. Free radicals are extremely dangerous. Uh, they can occur in cell organelles, and they can even occur directly at the nucleic acid level as well. And that's called mutations, isn't it? Okay, we've uh, avoided the word for a while, and we got a little bit more to talk about. So when we come back after our 10-minute break, we're going to talk about apoptosis a little bit, and I always feel like I don't talk about it enough. But I think it's better to just go into the principles of it rather than the, all the extreme biochemistry. So let's take our break, and we're going to be playing some music during the break from uh, Ricardo Corpus, who is here tonight. He's from the Philippines, and he's given us a couple of nice music. But we're going to also play one of my favorite songs uh, from Leonard Skinner called Sweet Home Alabama. And we will see you in 10 minutes, folks.
others lie while some tell the truth. And some say poems and some do sing. And others sing through their guitar strings. Some know it all while some act dumb. Let the bass line to the bang of the drum. And some can swim, but some will sink. And some will find their minds and think. Others walk while others run. You can't talk peace and have a gun. Some are hurt and start to cry. Don't ask me how, don't ask me why. And some are friends and some are foes. Some have some, while some have no. music. I wanted to thank, once again, Ricardo Corpuz for sending us uh, this, these two last songs from the Philippines. I really enjoyed them a lot. And I want to remind you, everybody that sends me songs, these songs will be played eventually. Maybe not now or next week, but eventually I'm starting to collect a big bucket of student music. And they will all be played, because if you do the math and if you multiply 75, by five. That's the number of songs that we play in the year, and your song will be played. Um, I wanted to, uh, another thought that I got during the break was that, you know, I don't know exactly what all 150 of you are doing right now, but if you want to get the most out of this course, what I was thinking was either you should download the PowerPoints before, during, or after the presentation, and or maybe print them out even, and then just write on them. So if I if I were you and I was listening to me, I would probably be, have some permanent record of these PowerPoints and then just scribble on them, you know, uh, make quick little notes. And I think that's probably how you get the most out of it. Uh, last announcement I wanted to make is that I did promise you at the end of the second hour we would be uh, taking microphone questions as well. And I noticed that uh, Dr. Uh, Girish has answered a lot of questions already and uh, I only wanted to focus in on a certain group of questions. There were several questions that say, oh I missed the last session, how can I blah 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 blah. Well, the answer to all questions like that is go to the first session which is on my website or the answer to all the question is go to www.medicalschoolpathology.com click on the first link to register click on the second link to look at all the old movies and remember this movie or this session today will be online 
uh, in a few hours after the session is over. Uh, last time I did it in four hours, the first time I did it in six hours, but by the end of the day, within a few hours, all of these will be online. Okay, we're done with the little announcements. And what we're going to do now in the second half is finish up a little bit on a few remaining topics uh, on cell injury and death and apoptosis. And then uh, I have also picked a few slides, which I'll show you, by the way. I've picked, uh, oh, maybe seven or eight slides, maybe ten, I don't know how many, maybe a dozen slides to look at uh, to demonstrate all of the principles that we talked about. And remember, these are going to be our actual microscopic slides. Okay, so let's get going. We said that apoptosis was the type of cell death that has to occur during the normal development of a uh, tissue or a cell or an organ, and it's pre-programmed. There are certain things that happen which trigger off the sequence by which the cells die and are ultimately replaced. And then we said there's something called sort of like pathologic apoptosis, which is also called necrosis. Cells that die, not because they're pre-programmed, but because there is some type of injury, reversible, irreversible, so forth. The good examples of apoptosis are embryos. If you remember from embryology, there's a whole bunch of cells there, and they're just not there anymore when that uh, embryo grows up into a, a person, and where those cells have to die. So they die by virtue of apoptosis. It's a normal, healthy, developmental thing. We also said that in old age, sometimes the endocrine glands can envelope or look like they are uh, hypoplastic or perhaps atrophic, if you want to use that word. And that's also an example of where did the uh, endocrine gland go? Well, a lot of the cells were lost by this process of apoptosis. Some of the parts of the body that have a very, very high mitotic turnover, like the lining of the GI tract or the crypts of Lieberkuhn, for example, in the a large bowel or the cells in the small bowel, the epithelial cells, they turn over quickly and they have to die also. That's also an example of apoptosis. What about when you look at an organ like an appendix or anything or a lung? It's just loaded with pneumonia. All of these inflammatory cells, they're uh, infiltrating the septa, they're in the alveoli, and then when the person uh, is better, they're gone. Well, what happens to those inflammatory cells? Well, they are apoptotic as well. They've gone away. Um, sometimes uh, when certain harmful cells develop, I would like to think tumor cells, for example, and the body still has the capacity to destroy those cells. That would be an example of apoptosis as well. Sometimes they don't have the capacity to destroy the cells, and the tumor develops. And a lot of times in the process of apoptosis, you just have a whole bunch of T cells, cytotoxic T cells, directly cleaning up an area that needs to be cleaned up. Now, what is pathologic apoptosis? Well, pa pathologic apoptosis <clears throat> is when cells die because of toxic effects. Or perhaps another example that Robbins uses would be a duct obstruction. If you have an obstruction to a duct, some of the cells uh, that uh, would normally uh, be nourished or fed are apoptotic as well. Uh, tumor cells, we mentioned, can become apoptotic. So that would be an example of pathologic apoptosis. But remember, it's a spectrum. You cannot say that there is such a thing as like pure apoptosis or pure necrosis. And another uh, example of that is if you, if you looked at the cellular changes, what happens to the cells, what happens to the cyto, um, organelles, it, they look the same whether the cell is necrotic or apoptotic. So a lot in the old days before we had the concept of apoptosis, we actually called everything necrosis. We're looking at cells with the nucleus dissolving, you know, karyolysis, karyorexis. Uh, we called that necrosis, but it could just as easily have been apoptosis. So what is the general uh, sequence of events that happens when cells die from apoptosis? Well, they decrease in size, first of all. They shrink. Could you call, if you want to call that process a hypotrophy? I, I guess you could, but nobody does call it that. But decrease in the cell size. And then you have an increase in the chromatin 
concentration, the cell becomes hyperchromatic because it is uh, dying. Another word for that is pycnosis, or hyperchromatic cells due to apoptosis. Eventually, those nuclei start to dissolve. They become fragmented. That's called karyorexis. Eventually, they're gone completely. They're dissolved. They're already chewed up by the lysosomes. That's called karyolysis. There's a whole family of proteases and capsases which are dissolving sub substances with the cell, including the nucleus. So that's why uh, when you look at a very early myocardial infarct, for example, before you even see the neutrophils infiltrating the dead tissue, you'll see that most of the myocardial cells don't have nuclei anymore. And that might be as little as only 24 hours you know, before the neutrophils comes in. We also noticed it from electron microscopy that a apoptotic cell has blebs, and eventually there are mechanisms which trigger off then complete swallowing up of these dead, dying cells by macrophages or neutrophils, any cell that has the capacity to phagocytize dead tissue, which is the process called phagocytosis. Okay, here is a uh, cell. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I want to call this normal or if I want to call it a little bit hyperchromatic, but eventually you can see by the time the nucleus starts to dissolve in fragments, the chromatin is a lot denser, isn't it? So that's preceded by the entire nucleus becoming more hyperchromatic. And eventually, this is completely dissolved and you just don't see a nucleus anymore. Here's the concept of phagocytosis. You can see that these are either neutrophils or probably macrophages because they're very, very granular. And that is the process that we'll talk about in much greater detail in inflammation by the mechanisms by which predominantly macrophages, but also neutrophils, have the signals whereby which they take dead material, dying cells, karyorectic, karyolytic cells, and digest them completely. And that's how they disappear. They're eaten up. A uh, little bit about the biochemistry of apoptosis. You know, in the process of this occurring, there has to be a digestion of the proteins within the cell. The cells are predominantly protein. And this family of enzymes are called caspases. Uh, if you're a biochemist, you would rather use the word cysteine aspartic proteases. And they play an essential role in the uh, dissolution of apoptotic cells. Eventually, there are uh, enzymes which break up everything in the cell, including the DNA, and then make that cell presentable for phagocytic recognition. And at that point, the whole cell is chewed up. But the cell that's chewed up is already dead, and it's already starting to break down as well. Uh, at the subcellular uh, level, in apoptosis and necrosis, some of the concepts which occur are uh, autodigestion of the cells by lysosomes. You know that lysosomes are nothing more but bags of digestive enzymes, which pretty much behave. But in uh, apoptosis and necrosis, these uh, lysosomes rupture and they start digesting things even before the macrophage is coming in. There's activation of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. There is mitochondrial swelling. And remember, just like the cell swells because of its loss of ability to keep water out, well, so do the mitochondria. So as the mitochondria go once again, and so do the, uh, so does the cell. Breakdown of the cytoskeleton, not only the thin filaments like actin and myosin, but also the microtubules and a whole family of intermediate filaments that you heard about from cell biology like keratin, desmin, vimentin, neurofilaments, gliofilaments. These are all things which are ultimately broken down by enzymes as well. Okay, 
let's introduce the concept of things accumulating within cells now. And if you want to know what kind of things accumulate within cells, the answer is everything. So if you go to biochemistry and you go to lipids, if you go to carbohydrates, if you go to proteins, uh, you see and just about anything can accumulate in the cell uh, patho pathologically. And the general principle is, is if you have a substance which cannot be processed within the cell due to a lack of an enzyme or perhaps just an overwhelming amount of stuff coming into the cell, you then have intracellular accumulations. Uh, you can see fat infiltrating a liver or a pancreas or in the case of uh, fat people, you know, the entire body. Some of these fats could either be neutral fat, they could be cholesterol, which has quite a, a distinctive appearance microscopically relative to neutral fat. You can see hyalin. And remember we told you that hyalin is not any specific thing. Hyalin is simply defined as any pink or eosinophilic uh, sometimes it's granular, sometimes it's grassy, glassy, but it's all proteinaceous material and it accumulates in and around cells. And don't ever be spooked by the word hyaline because it doesn't mean anything. All it means is pink stuff. Glycogen is a carbohydrate, can accumulate within the cell, particularly in this family of diseases called glycogen storage diseases, a whole wide variety of them, which we'll talk about later, in which uh, the glycogen cannot be broken the, down and therefore it accumulates within cells. And also pigments can uh, uh, accumulate within a cell. And there's two kinds of pigments. There's the exogenous pigments or pigments that come from the environment like smoke particles, like anthracotic particles, like tattoos. And then there's endogenous pigments pigments which are normally present within the body, like hemocytorin, like bile, like melanin. They can accumulate within cells too. And I'll give you a really, really good tip right now. What's the difference? We already talked about what is the difference between an exogenous and an endogenous pigment. But you want to know what the difference is under a microscope? All of the exogenous pigments are really, really, really black. They are really black, okay? Like soot, like anthracotic pigment, like tattoo pigment. They are really black. Whereas the endogenous pigments, they're usually not really, really, really black. They usually have kind of a golden, refractile, brownish-red appearance, whether you're talking about bile or lipofuction or hemocytorin or melanin. They're not really totally black. They're more like a dark golden brown. And of course, calcium can accumulate within cells and around cells. And calcium, as you know, accumulates within dying and damaged cells. And sometimes calcification in itself is kind of like the end stage of the inflammatory process. So just like you would like to think of inflammation as number one, infiltration by neutrophils, number two, uh, organization of blood vessels, and number three, fibrosis. Sometimes calcification goes hand in hand with that fibrosis. It could calcify because of local factors, like dead or damaged tissue locally, and that's called dystrophic calcification. Or could it cal calcium can accumulate simply because there's too much calcium in the blood, like from a parathyroid adenoma, and that's called metastatic calcification. And metastatic calcification does not mean that there's metastatic tumor. It means metastatic because the there's just too much calcium in the blood to begin with. Well, here's the lipid law, okay? When lipids accumulate inside of organs for any reason, any organ that accumulates fat is going to be yellower than it normally should be or very, very, very yellow. You remember why that adrenal cortex looked so yellow? It looked yellow because those cells are all fat, aren't they? They're cholesterol precursors to make the steroid hormones. Now, microscopically, any lipid appears as clear because in the process of processing tissues, uh, they're passed through xylene, and xylene is a fat solvent. So even though grossly all lipids are yellow, microscopically they're all washed out and they're nothing. Here's a fatty liver, okay? 
you might say, well, maybe this bigger is big, uh, maybe this liver is bigger than its normal 1,500 grams. Who knows? It's not on the scale yet. But you cut the surface and you go, well, you know, I, I know a liver should look kind of like brownish, but isn't this a little bit yellower than it should be? So the reason why the liver is yellow is the same reason why anything in the body looks yellow, from a corpus luteum to an adrenal cortex, from an atherosclerotic plaque, it's because it's filled with fat. And look, I said gross yellow, but microscopically washed out. Well, even if you can't recognize the fact that this is a liver, and I'll tell you, even a pathologist might have a hard time, what you can realize is that there's a lot of vacuoles. They're in the cells, they're between the cells, some of them are bigger than the cells, and this is all fat. Now let me ask you a logic question. This is not a pathology question, this is a logic question. If you took all the fats out of this liver, and let's say the liver weighed 3,000 grams, and you boiled all the fat out of it, how much would it weigh after you boiled it out? Well, you know it's about half, don't you? Because if you look at this cross-sectional area and your mind says, well, about 50% of everything I see in this field is washed out fat, that means that the liver is half fat too, doesn't it? Okay, here's another type of fat lipid called cholesterol. Cholesterol appears in two forms, whether you're in an atherosclerotic plaque or elsewhere where there's cholesterol, like in a gallbladder and diseases. Some of them are foamy macrophages. You see that? You see that? You see that? They have a little nucleus. These are foamy macrophages. The foam is due to cholesterol. The reason why it's white is because cholesterol is a lipid and it washes out. Now, in more extreme cases, the cholesterol actually crystallizes. And when you're looking at a tissue and you see these little clefts, C-L-E-F-T-S, within tissue, it could be an atherosclerotic plaque or it could be anything that's infiltrated with cholesterol. Then you're going to see these cholesterol clefts. And I'll tell you, most pathologists, when they see a picture like this, as a knee-jerk reflex, they're going to say, oh, that's an atherosclerotic plaque because it has all these cholesterol clefts. Well, before you even get the clefts, remember, you get these foamy macrophages too. It's all cholesterol. Pigments. Okay, we said that the exogenous pigments, like tattoo pigment, you know, little India ink particles that are put into your dermis, or anthracotic pigment, which you get if you are a breathing air, you know, within 100 miles of a city, which is practically, you know, every corner of the earth. They're very, very, very black. Whereas an endogenous pigment, like digested blood pigment called hemosiderin, or the pigment from the melanocytes of your skin, melanin, or an aging pigment, which we can call lipofuxin, or bile pigment. This is all kind of a refractile, golden, yellowish brown. It's not nearly as black. So here's the rule. When you look at a pigment and it's as black as hell, call it exogenous. It's probably did not come from that patient's body. If it has kind of a refractile golden, call it endogenous. And if it's endogenous, most likely it's going to be one of these three things, hemosiderin, melanin, or bile, or maybe lipofuxin. Those are, that covers about 99% of the endogenous pigments. See this piece of skin? You know it's skin instantly, don't you? There's the stratum corneum, there's the epidermis, there's the papillary dermis, here's the deeper dermis. And let me ask you, is this pigment inside of macrophages as black as black could be. Yes, it is. So you know that's exogenous pigment. Now, it's a tattoo. And do, the, probably the thing that you're, look, you're thinking right now is, my God, how could that tattoo be so dark when I'm only seeing just a few little stippled, tiny pieces of pigment here? Well, let me tell you, it doesn't take much pigment in the dermis to make the entire skin look black. And remember, this epidermis and the superficial dermis is relatively free of pigment. But then you start to see it here, and here, and here, and here, and a big band here, and a big band here, and a big band here. And you cannot see the nucleus or even the cell that it's in 
but because this pigment seems to conform to the shape of a cell more or less you can bet that it's being chewed up by the major gobblers of the human body called macrophages okay what about this look at these lungs they're as black as black could be and you take a section through those lungs and you see all these really really dark pigments well that's anthracosis okay it's not just in coal miners it's not just in smokers it's people that live near industrial areas which is everywhere and I think I've asked this question before but I'll uh, ask it again what percentage of uh, the human population has some degree of anthracosis in their lungs or the lymph nodes that drain the lungs yeah we all know it's a hundred percent and you want to know something else the reason why anthracosis looks so hideous as a gross specimen is because the macrophages in the lung are very very rich in the sub pleural area so you would think oh my god if I cut through this lung it's gonna look completely black no chances are it's gonna look only really really black sub pleurally the rest of the lung might look relatively normal okay what kind of pigment is this is this really 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 dark pigment or is this kind of a golden refractile this is hemosiderin it's also you could see within macrophages if it was really really dark and within macrophages you couldn't even see the nucleus could you but in this one you can see nuclei these are macrophages this is what you would call a partially or broken down blood because if you remember the uh, hemoglobin of blood goes through various phases becomes bilirubin of ultimately it becomes hemosiderin which is the main storage form of iron and hemosiderin inside of macrophages is what makes a lot of tissues look black also even though it's kind of a golden brown microscopically calcification we said there's two kinds dystrophic which means there's local factors maybe inflammation often associated with fibrosis due to the fact that dead and dying cells accumulate calcium and if there's really a lot of death and a lot of dying there might be a lot of calcium also calcium uh, looks very very uh, on, on, on a microscope looks kind of chipped it's often it chips away from the tissue and it's very very darkish blue you might mistake it for exogenous pigments but if you look closely it's not really really black it's more of a blackish blue if the you know uh, thing is stained normally with hematoxylin and eosin and then the metastatic calcification refers to the fact that it's not calcified because of local damage it's calcified because there's hypercalcemia like in the hyperparathyroidism now to make the uh, subject even more complicated sometimes in metastatic disease from tumors you can have extensive metastases to bone and that's going to result in hypercalcemia as well isn't it because the bone is being chewed up so sometimes a metastatic disease can produce metastatic calcification but remember they're two different completely different words well guess what we're down to our last thing here and I'm not going to say much more about it but if you think a lot about pathologic processes, about aging, about dying, not just of cells, but of human beings as well, you might say, why do cells die? Why do people die? And you might say, well, you know, it was just God's time to take them. That's, you know, the program theory. You just uh, have a day written in stone that is going to be your last day of life and bingo. You might say, well, maybe the reason why uh, the person died or the cell died is because it was overworked. It was worked to death. That's another sort of school of thought. But generally, the pre-programmed theory works the best. So when a lot of these health nut people come up to you and they say, oh, well, if you do this, you're going to live to be 100. Well, you know that's baloney, don't you? Because according to the pre-programmed theory, there's a lot we could do to keep ourselves healthy. But generally speaking, we're going to go when it is our programmed time to go. Okay, so we're done with the uh, presentation part. We do have a, a couple minutes maybe to look at one or two slides, and then we'll take questions. But I want to ask you a question first. Uh, am I speaking loudly and clearly enough for all of you? Does anybody have a hard time? Okay, next question. Uh, was the music too loud? <laughs> 
Well, you know, somebody said no, but you know, I think you have a volume button on your computer. Uh, can I ask another question? Uh, did Dr. Girish answer a lot of your questions nicely? If, if he did, I want you to thank him because he's going to be here for a while. And they're all thanking you, Dr. Girish. I want to let you know we appreciate you. And uh, I had planned on doing a lot of cases for lab, but I'm going to only do three, okay? Because I don't want to overwork you. I know you've been listening hard. I know a lot of you are there. And rather than showing all 12 or so of these slides, I'm only going to show three. And this is to uh, demonstrate an extremely important principle. And it's the principle of plasia. Okay? Now, here's our microscope. These are not pictures. This is not internet stuff. This is a real microscope I'm looking at. This is real tissue. And for those of you, you might recognize this as an adrenal. And by the way, you'll probably recognize it as a left adrenal as well, because as an, it's not flat. Now, you know that these big vascular spaces on the inside is the medulla. And maybe you'll see some cells, a lot of smooth muscle, a lot of central veins. But from about here to here is the, is the adrenal cortex, okay? Now, if I asked you to count the number of cells between the medulla, which is right here, and the cortex, you'd probably say, well, I did a really good count, and there's, uh, you know, 123 uh, layers. And, and they look a little bit of granular under the capsule, and they look like linear fascicles, most of the layer. And then they have kind of a reticulated pattern. So there's your granulosa fasciculata. But you would say, this is a normal adrenal. Count your number of cells. Okay, now what if I showed you an adrenal now that did not look quite as thick as the last one? And I think you could tell, even from this picture, that if you go from the uh, medulla, which is right here, this big vein, to the outside, you're not going to say there's, you know, 157 cells. You're going to say there's, oh, there's maybe only 12 or 13 or something. So what does this demonstrate? Uh, hypoplasia, dysplasia, metaplasia, anaplasia. Yeah, hypoplasia. Now, you want to know the funny thing? Even though this is called hypoplasia from our strict definition, the slide was labeled as atrophy. And atrophy would only be if the cells got smaller. And the cells didn't get smaller. It was actually the uh, number of cells uh, that got smaller. So correctly, this is hypoplasia. Now, can I ask you one last question here? Here's another adrenal, which is going to be under your eyeballs in about three seconds. And once again, if you look there where the capsule is, and you look all the way down here where the medulla is, what would you call this? Hyperplasia. That's right, hyperplasia. Now, can I ask you a question? If these hyperplastic cells had kind of a nodular configuration like they do here, might you want to use the word nodular hyperplasia as well? And let me ask you another question. Let's say that if this increased thickness of cells was only in one area, only one nodule, and the rest of the adrenal cortex was normal, would you probably want to call that an adenoma? Okay, good. Everybody got all the questions right today. And I wish, do you want me to show another slide? Yes or no? Come on, give me the correct answer. Yeah, everybody's saying yes. So let's look at another slide. Labs are fun. Um, oh, here's a quick one. We've already seen this a few seconds ago. Uh, here's a lymph node. You could tell instantly it's a lymph node because you have sort of like the rounder things at the cortex. But look, most of the medullary areas are increased. So if you wanted to call this a hyperplasia in which the medullary uh, sinuses are prominent, you can. Now, take a look at this area here. You already know this is as black as black could be. So. Is this pigment uh, intrinsic or extrinsic, or in, in exogenous or endogenous? Exogenous. Now, uh, exogenous pigment is fill in the blanks. Exogenous pigment, dark black pigment in a lymph node, is blank until proven otherwise. Correct. Anthracosis in the lymph node. Guess what? Do you think there's one person in the audience now 
that doesn't have any anthracosis in their lymph nodes? No. Okay, let's do another quickie. Let's do, um, uh, oh, let's do this one. Here's another uh, example of hyperplasia. Do you remember I told you the other day that uh, adult bone marrow is usually 50% fat and 50% blood cells? Well, look, is this 50% fat? Or do you think this is only or 2% fat? This is almost all cells. So this is a hyperplastic bone marrow. Now, even though it's only H&E and you maybe can't identify all the cells that well, look, there's a bone spicule, there's an osteocyte, there's probably an osteoblast over there at the edge. If you remember me telling you that the normal ratio of white cell precursors to red cell precursors is about 3 to 1, then what are all of these little cells here that have dark nuclei? These are all erythroid cells. So this is not a 3 to 1 ratio. This is probably a 1 to 1 ratio. So what does that mean? It means you have increased cells in the bone marrow, which means, and you know that because of the decreased fat, and most of the cells are erythroid cells. And so this is erythroid hyperplasia, isn't it? And you want to know? You're probably not going to believe these are erythroid cells because you might say, well, how do you know these aren't lymphocytes? Well, they're erythroid cells, okay? Now, you could do a stain to positively identify them, but I want to ask you a question. What percentage of the cells in this field are erythroid cells? 80, 90 percent, maybe? And I already told you there should be three times as many white cells as red cells. And look, almost all of them are red cell precursors. That's probably a white cell because it has an open nucleus. That's probably a white cell. That's probably a white cell. That's probably a white cell. But most of these are dark uh, erythroid cells. Okay. You know what? We're going to stop now. We had a good day. Oh, let me show you one more thing. What is this? You know what organ this is? Aha, you know it's liver. If you look, you can see sort of a hexagonal relationship between the various veins. Now let me show you something. The liver might not look too bad, but you see how those vacuoles within the liver cells that are washed out? What is that? Yeah, it's a fatty liver. It's not as fatty as the other one we saw, but that's all fat. And can I ask you another question? Um, if the fat is chiefly within the hepatocyte, it's smaller, it's not big like you saw that, the other one in class, would this be called microvesicular steatosis or macrovesicular? Yeah, micro, because the vacuoles are all smaller, smaller than the cells. But let's say all of the uh, vacuoles were this big, you know, much bigger than a cell then you'd probably call that predominantly macrovesicular. Okay, so a lot of the principles we talked about during our class, we were able to demonstrate in lab. And uh, we got to sort of end now, uh, but I want to really find out. Uh, let me ask a question to all of you. For those of you who ask questions and I wasn't able to answer them, uh, did Dr. Uh, Girish uh, answer them okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to criticize them, but I just want to make sure all your questions were answered. Is there anybody who feels their questions were not answered? Okay, everybody's saying he's great. I know he's great, so I'm glad that you realized it too. And uh, we will now uh, tell you his full name, Dr. Girish Kamat. And I promise you I pronounced that correctly. So expect Dr. Kamat to help me out in the future as well. And I'm glad he was able to answer your questions because there's hundreds of them and I just don't have time to go back to them. But what I do have time to go to now is to see those of you who might have raised your hands because we still do have a few more minutes. And most of the time the students do not raise the hands too much. But I see a couple hands that are raised here, and we want to give you the opportunity as well. So if you have a microphone and it's working,
We're going to find out because the first person we're going to talk to is Alejandro Quan, who has his hand raised. Hi, Alejandro. Can you hear us? Yes. We can hear you perfectly well all around the world. Do you want to ask us anything? Or did you have your hand raised accidentally? Yeah, I had my, I had my hand raised accidentally. Oh, well, that's Sorry. okay. That's okay. Where are you from? I'm from Guatemala. Okay, well, uh, Guatemala rocks. Uh, hello to Guatemala. We'll move on to our next hand. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Ashok Kumar, do you want to ask us something? Or did you go away? Can you hear us? I could hear a little noise on your end. You can speak if you want. Okay, well, Ashok, if you have nothing to say, I'll move on. And don't feel bad because most of the questions, we have hundreds of questions that were asked on chat. But if you want to say something for the group, feel free. We'll move on to the next hand. And maybe there isn't a next hand. Oh, yeah, there's a couple of hands. Mohammed, how are you doing? We can't hear you too well. There's a lot of buzzing in the background. Unfortunately, you're not coming through unless you speak maybe louder into the microphone. Sorry, it's just a bad connection. The connection is probably on your end rather than ours, but we do appreciate that you raise your hand, and maybe you would be better off to ask the question uh, an email or chat. Sorry. Neil S., how are you doing? How are you doing? Are you there, Neil? Are you there, Neil? Uh, yes, but can you hear me? I can hear you pretty well. So if you have something to say, I would recommend you say it loud and slow. Okay, so now um, my question was in regards to one of your um, uh, lectures when you met a, in one of your archives. You mentioned about um, uh, helping out with uh, with, uh, past, with past programs or past curriculum at uh, other schools. Do you, does that offer still stand? Are you still um, interested in doing that? Okay, you asked a question about a path curriculum, and I made an offer. Yeah, in, in, in one of your, in, in the archive of um, lectures yes. last year, I was watching one of them, the very first one, I think, or something like that. You mentioned that uh, you were interested in, in, in maybe, you know, uh, traveling and, and, and doing, uh, you know, a lecture or something like that. Oh, a um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I have done that several I times that already. Several. In fact, I could even do webinars okay. from the schools that I travel to. Okay. So... Okay. I, I can offer the school to for their students to attend my course online, or if they want to make me a visiting professor, I'll be glad to go to their school as long as it's in a nice, warm area. Okay. Okay, Neil. And if you have anything, if you have a way to help me uh, survive this cold Chicago winter by sending me to the Caribbean or someplace, I'm very thankful to you. Okay. Okay, um, Neil. Should I contact you? Send you an email? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, I believe that was all our questions, and it is now exactly 11 o'clock, so we're going to play our closing song. This is a very special closing song. I'm going to give you the uh, actual lyrics before I play the song. This song is dedicated to Wiggy. Wiggy is, in reality, Wegdan Rashad. She's in Cairo. She took our course two years ago, and she did very well in our course. And then when she took her national pathology exams for the entire country of Egypt, she scored number one. So I have always been very, very proud of Wiggy. And I imagine everybody here can be number one in one way or another. Now, the song that comes to my mind <clears throat> when I think of Wiggy's extreme Olympic performance is a song that Gloria Estefan sang for the uh, Atlanta Olympics. So we'll close our 
uh, session with Gloria Estefan singing Reach. Some dreams. 